Earth or what they say around. Enhanced encryption. Hmm. Well, hello there. I'm I'm very new, but I recognise Rory of Boyle because several years ago you showed me around the finds of the excavation in Carrickfergus Castle in the sort of right. Pontecroft. Oh yes, okay. I don't know if you remember. During um, that time, the minister made the visit free for a couple of weeks. Oh, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. We found and you were excavating, and there were, you could see all the railway lines and the turntable inside. Yeah, we, we found the um, the wall of the uh, medieval hall house, but oh, people, right. were more, people were more interested in actually the Victorian mini railway. <laughs> <laughs> you should get it running again. Have a funicular up and down to the outside. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that was fully excavated by a company called NAC, and they did a fantastic job, and you could see the whole turntable and the, uh, uh, and the railway. It was an important part of Victorian uh, castle, yeah. and perhaps it's people, um, the fact that people oh, weren't yeah. aware of it. Um, um, it surprised them that there's so much archaeology, even from Victorian yeah. times, um, surviving. But yeah, that was a very interesting excavation. I wanted to go in and see the new roof. Uh, myself and a friend were at the lecture. John O'Keefe was involved. Yes. Uh, as part of the Ulster Museum lecture series. Mm. I used to know John from work. Yes. Oh, okay, yeah. I used to work for uh, the planning service. Yes, I mean, um, they, they, um, they were a very good job done on the, on the roof. And there was, like, of course, a conference in Carrickfergus a couple of years before that. that discussed all the aspects of mm -hmm. the uh, roof. Yeah. You, um, yeah. you had an influence on me. I, I bought your book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. <laughs> OK, it's now 7.40. We did tell people that we were going to kick off at 7.30. So I'm going to do a, a brief introduction. And then I'm going to hand over to Jill. So, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, oh, yeah. On behalf of the committee of the Ulster Archaeological Society, I'd like to wish you all a happy new year, and I'd like to welcome you to the first UAS lecture of 2021. For those of you who don't know me, or for those of you who've forgotten me, it seems so long since we have a, had an evening <laughs> lecture. Uh, my name is Muriel Boyle, and I am the UAS president. Before I hand over to, to uh, tonight's speaker, I'd like to tell you a little about what's on offer uh, from the UAS in the coming months. Because of the coronavirus pandemic, all UAS lectures and workshops will be online for the foreseeable future. So please ch keep checking the UAS Facebook and UAS websites. Um, and that will give details of all UAS acti activities. And a big thank you to Dr. Duncan Berryman for overseeing the technological end of this. And over the last year, we've had to adapt um, not being able to have face-to-face -face activities, uh, adapt to a technology in a way that we hadn't before. You've seen our e-newsletter, we had our conference online, uh, and now we're doing our lectures. And a lot of uh, uh, the reason for the success of that was, was uh, Duncan overseeing it, so thank you, Duncan. Um, apart from tonight's lecture, uh, our next activity is on February the 22nd, and it's the UAS Annual General Meeting. And all fully paid up members of uh, the UAS can participate in this. On March the 1st, we have our first workshop, and that's been given by David Craig, who's on the UAS committee. And it's a workshop on how to use online maps for discovery and research. We have our next lecture then in March, March the 29th, Dr. Adrian Maldonado from the National Mu Museum of Scotland. And he'll be talking about rethinking early medieval Whithorn and the conversion to Christianity in Scotland. Um, on April the 28th, then we have Professor Eileen Murphy from Queens and she'll be talking about the life and times of Takabuki in ancient Egypt and in Belfast. But for tonight's uh, uh, lecture, we're delighted to have Dr. Jill Plunkett, who is very well known to many of you. Um, Jill's a reader in the School of Natural Built Environment, Queen's University, Belfast, and specializing in environmental change and resilience. Her interests include reconstructing past environments and cultural activity through pollen and plant macrofossil analysis, reconstructing past climate change through peat-based proxies, tephrochronology, later prehistoric Ireland, and wetland archaeology. And she teaches courses on ancient humans and landscapes, environmental change, past, present, and future, Ireland and prehistory, and paleo-environmental techniques. And I was looking through her profile today, and I noticed she has 93 publications from 2002, which is astonishing. Um, and you know that the uh, US were very um, keen on the dissemination of information. So that's a fabulous publication record. Tonight, Jill will be talking about how Mike Bailey was right, resolving the links between volcanoes, ice cores, tree rings, and societal responses. 
But before I uh, um, uh, pass you over to Jill for uh, for her to give you uh, her paper, could I ask you please to mute your microphones and turn off your cameras? And just to repeat again, that questions can be asked in the chat, chat box section of Zoom and Jill will answer them at the end of the night. So Dr. Jill Plunkett. Thank you very much, Rory. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get rid of the Zoom bits. I don't know if you could see the Zoom windows that are over, lying over on top of my PowerPoint. Um, so said, thank you, Rory, and thank you very much to the committee for inviting me to give this talk today. Um, I'm really pleased to see that the protagonist of today's talk, Mike Bailey, is in the audience, and I'm sure he'll be really able, to, uh, better able to answer the questions that you're likely to have um, after the presentation. Um, so before I begin, I do want to introduce you uh, to some key players in this whole story. First of all, Mike himself, a dendrochronologist that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, Mike has been instrumental in constructing the Belfast um, Oak Chronology that has provided us with a huge amount of information, not simply about the dates of, of archaeological sites, but also about past environmental change during the Holocene in Ireland. Um, other key players include um, Jonathan Pilcher and Valerie Hall. Uh, Jonathan was also involved in the early days of dendrochronology, but more recently he and Valerie um, have to be credited with the, the initiation of tephrochronology, the use of volcanic ash layers as a dating method um, in paleoenvironmental studies. Um, and it's really very much their work that I'm building upon here today. Two other players that I'd like to introduce you to are Joe McConnell and Michael Siegel, who are two ice core workers, um, without whom I have nothing to say to, nothing to add to Mike's story. Um, but they have been wonderful in providing us um, with ice um, and then helping us resolve some of the issues of understanding past volcanic eruptions, um, their timing and their impacts. Um, so the other, right, I'll move on now to talking about some of the, the, the key areas that I'm going to be discussing today. First of all, dendrochronology. You're probably all familiar with the fact that trees grow, as trees grow, they respond to their environment. Uh, when the environmental conditions um, are good, they, they grow well. And when the environmental conditions are less favorable, they struggle to grow. And, it, and there are certain conditions that might make them um, have growth downturns. Uh, so it could be drought, it could be cold, it could be um, too much water. But, but very often the trees manage to, to weather the conditions um, and they survive. But their growth ring patterns reflect the growing conditions from year to year and trees in a given area are all going to be responding to the same types of environmental conditions. And these give us ring patterns that enable us to match the tree rings from one tree to tree rings of other trees of a similar age. And it's on that basis that we're able to overlap tree ring patterns and, and produce dates for, um, for timbers and interpret the rings in terms of their, their significance for understanding past environmental change. Um, another type of evidence that we can draw from um, our ice cores. So, uh, ice, ice cores accumulate in any areas that are particularly cold. So the, the most famous ice cores are in the high latitudes, Greenland, Antarctica. Um, and there the snow is falling year, on, year in, year out, um, trapping snow and ultimately turning into ice. Because the snowfall is different between the, the winter and the summer, it's got different impurities in it, um, it's forming under different uh, climatic conditions, different weather conditions. It, it leaves an annual signal so we can see the seasonal changes in the ice and like with tree rings we can identify those years and count those um, ice layers in order to be able to date the ice cores. So the ice cores have a, are, are very good at providing us with um, a chronology for when changes were happening in the past. Now whereas tree rings grow, uh, put, well, most trees will put on a ring, a growth ring every year the tree rings can be dated precisely to a particular year in the past. Ice cores are a little bit trickier because the ice doesn't, doesn't always play ball. You can have some ice melting, you can have um, climatic anomalies or weather anomalies within a year that give us the impression of a double year signal. So there are issues in, in terms of understanding the chronology of the ice cores, but they're relatively small. So the ice core chronologies are still excellent compared to many of the other dating techniques that we use. 
Um, and as the ice is forming, it's, it's capturing information about the, the temperature, the climatic conditions that it's growing under. Um, and it can also trap dust from the atmosphere, including um, volcanic ash and aerosols that are emitted by eruptions. So just to note that tree rings respond to their environment. Um, it can be difficult to say when, when we see that a tree has suffered, that it hasn't grown very well, it can be difficult to say precisely why it wasn't growing very well. Um, ice cores also respond to climate change. So the amount of snow uh, that will fall will depend on the, the weather, for example. Uh, but they're also tracking information. So they're very much recording what's going on um, and recording lots of different proxies that we can compare with each other to try and understand what the, the record is telling us. Um, it's also, this, this story today is very much about volcanoes and understanding volcanic impacts. Uh, so when we have a large volcanic eruption, so we're talking about the explosive volcanic eruptions, they'll emit things up into the atmosphere. So they'll throw up um, gases and, and bits of rock, bits of ash into the atmosphere. And the very fine material, the very fine ash, um, it's extremely light. It will, it, and in an explosive eruption, it will go high up into the atmosphere. Um, and so will the gases that are emitted by the, the volcano. And these will convert to aerosols when they mix with the, the moisture in the atmosphere. If they get into the, the stratosphere, then the, the aerosols have the potential to um, reflect sunlight back out into space. So they radiate heat back out into space and this can cause a cooling at the ground surface. The aerosols can say they're extremely light, so they can stay suspended in the stratosphere for months or potentially several years, depending on how much is produced and how high they were ejected. The volcanic ash, again, we're talking about microscopic, well, the stuff that travels far from the volcano is microscopic, um, and it is also extremely light. It will stay suspended in the air. Well, if it gets into the stratosphere, it will stay suspended for days to months. Maybe extremely small particles can stay um, for longer periods of time, but they're getting below the detection limit of the types of, of tephra that we would normally look at. Um, I should say, I will use the term tephra, ash and glass interchangeably. Tephra refers to all volcanic, all particles emitted by a volcanic eruption. Ash refers to the very fine component of the tephra. Um, and the bit that we analyze is actually the glass. So we're, we're getting material, molten um, magma that's solidifying in the atmosphere and forming glass shards. And it's glass chemistry that enables us to link the tephra, when we find these glass shards, we can analyze the chemistry of the glass um, and use that chemistry to tell us what volcano it came from. Usually, we don't always succeed in identifying its source. And the reason we can do that is because the geology of a particular volcanic source will be unique to that source. Um, and the glass chemistry should reflect the geology of that location. So as long as we have the information about the geology of the, the source volcano, we may be able to make a match. If a volcano has never been studied before, then we won't know what it, its tephra looks like. Okay, so I first met Mike when I came to do my master's in Queens in 1994. Now I have to confess, I did not know who Mike was. I'm not even sure I'd heard of dendrochronology. My background was archaeology, I studied archaeology in UCD. Um, and I'd never heard of Mount Hecla in Iceland either. So I very much enjoyed learning about um, Mike's perspective on understanding past climate change. And I particularly remember when he introduced um, the story, uh, his hypothesis about the, the eruption known as Hecla III and its link to uh, the Irish Bronze Age. So Mike had identified a uh, growth anomaly in Irish oaks. So a, a series of years, up to, up to about 18 years, in which the trees were barely managing to grow. Uh, so you've got all these annual rings that are um, crammed on top of each other. And this indicated a period of stress for the trees. Roughly about this time, it was known that Hecla had erupted in Iceland. Now, in fairness, the, the radiocarbon dates indicated that the eruption had happened sometime between about 1200 and about 900 BC, um, so, and the tree ring dated to 1159 BC. And there were a series of ice cores 
producing evidence for acid layers. So they were capturing sulfates uh, uh, that had been emitted by volcanic eruptions. Um, and one of their events, oh, oh, the, the ice cores seem to be picking up an event that could correspond to the same time period. So Mike had suggested that, the, well, we, knew, we know the trees had suffered a period of stress. We know that there was an eruption approximately around about that time. And we know that Hecla was a large eruption um, in the same time period. So Mike had suggested that perhaps Mount Hecla had been responsible for a climatic downturn at the time. That I don't have a problem with, but when Mike suggested that there might have been a link with the construction of hill forts, because Hockey's Fort and County Armagh um, had recently been dated to around about the same time, um, I, I had cause to, to pause um, because I was aware from, from having studied archaeology that hill forts were a phenomenon that, was, uh, that were being constructed in other locations. So it wasn't as if they suddenly appeared um, in Ireland. Um, but there were other sources of information. So Mike had, had looked at some literary evidence, uh, found that the end of the Shang dynasty um, had occurred around about the same time with some literary references to a variety of different events that suggested that there was some sort of um, climatic issue at the time. Similarly, in other parts of Europe, particularly around the Mediterranean, there were suggestions that there were social issues happening. So you've got um, populations moving, um, populations, uh, societies collapsing at this particular time, generally suggesting that maybe societies were under stress um, at this particular time period and potentially as a result of an environmental catastrophe or volcanic um, impact. Since then, uh, a lot more work has been done on the dating of hill forts. So Billy O'Brien uh, and James O'Driscoll have excavated a large number of, of hill forts and obtained dates for them. Um, and they have managed to demonstrate that hill forts are not um, a phenomenon associated with any strict time period. So yes, there are hill forts constructed in the 11th century or around about the 11th century, but there are certainly some hill forts that appear to have been constructed before 1200. And there were certainly some still being constructed around about 900 or 800 uh, BC. So that suggests hill forts were being constructed over a long time period, including before the climatic an anomaly. And it's very difficult therefore to say that hill forts were a response to a short lived climate event. Um, in addition, I'd managed to identify during my PhD uh, the presence of Hector III tephra in County Tyrone. And at the same time, Crystal van den Bogard had identified Hector III tephra in bogs in Germany. And for both our records, we'd, we had managed to date the tephra to about the 11th century, suggesting that the eruption happened in the 10 hundreds, not the 11 hundreds BC. So in 2006, I wrote uh, one of my first papers to suggest that, the, that we could no longer um, uphold the idea that Hector III caused an environmental downturn and triggered the construction of Bronze Age hill forts. And that was the first time I challenged one of Mike's uh, suggestions. What I can say is that we, we, we've demonstrated that Hecla is off the hook. Okay, so Hecla happened after, well after the 1159 BC event. The societal response in Ireland, at least, is questionable. I haven't really looked into societal responses elsewhere. Um, but be that as it may, we still, we're still left with the fact that something caused the trees to struggle. So there was some sort of climate anomaly or, or environmental anomaly happening in the mid 1100s. <clears throat> So the 1159 BC event was just one of several events that Mike had noticed um, as events in the tree rings, the Irish tree rings, that seemed to line up with um, events in American um, and sometimes German trees, um, as well as documentary evidence for various different types of things, whether it be atmospheric phenomena or famines or issues, collapses um, of particular dynasties or societies. Um, in addition to that, there were often um, ice core records suggesting that there were volcanic events um, or large volcanic events or always volcanic events, but in, in these cases, pretty significant volcanic events in around about the same time period. So we seem to be seeing 
a pattern of it that was repeated at different intervals with a series of um, environmental events recorded both in the trees and documentary records um, associated with ice cores, which might be suggesting that we've got um, volcanically forced environmental events going on. Um, the Irish oaks, as I said, are the, the tree ring records are dated precisely. Um, the ice cores, on the other hand, have a little bit of error, and that's what these little bars represent, a certain degree of chronological error. Similarly, some of the literary records are not precisely dated. Um, in 1984, uh, Hammer published new dates for three Greenland ice cores. And in this, in this paper, um, moved the AD 535 acid layer back to AD 516. So the, the dates were shifted and this event was no longer close to one of Mike's um, tree ring events. So the, the, the event that we see at 536 is one of two. There, there are two narrow ring, two, two tree ring downturns, one at 536 um, and a second at 540. So closely spaced events. Um, without a volcanic signal in the ice cores, it's difficult to argue that the, these are caused by volcanoes. So Mike suggested that perhaps they were caused by extraterrestrial impacts. So basically um, asteroids coming in um, and creating dust veils. And that was the basis for his book, Exodus to Arthur. However, um, subsequent to that, um, Lars Nadal published a new paper looking again at the ice core chronologies. Um, and they proposed that there was new ice core evidence for a volcanic um, event at 536. Uh, so they had identified, uh, the, the, date, the ice core dates were revised um, and they identified two closely spaced dates, one at 529 AD and one at 533 or 534 AD with a small chronological error reflecting the counting uncertainty of the ice cores. Now notice the, the date of this publication. 2008. Mike lost no time in writing a paper to follow up on that, uh, where he pointed out that there were consistent offsets in the dates of the ice cores. When he compared the dates of the ice core events, the volcanic events, and the dates of tree ring responses, there was a persistent and consistent offset of about seven years between the tree ring and the ice core ages. And he argued that the ice core chronologies needed to be moved by seven years in order to line up with the tree ring events. Um, so, and it, the basis for his argument was that the trees are precisely dated. The trees, the tree ring ages can't move, whereas the ice cores have a little bit of uncertainty um, and are therefore um, liable to a little bit of error, perhaps more error than the ice core workers had realized. Um, by moving the ice core chronology seven years, the 536, 540 events would line up. And as well as that, Mike's 550 BC, um, uh, Mike's 43 BC tree ring uh, would be matched by the 50 BC acid layer. So the 50 BC acid layer would come forward in time. Um, and a little bit further back in time, in the, the Middle Bronze Age, um, an acid layer that had been dated to, to the 1640s. The date moved a little bit from publication to publication. Um, he suggested that this should move forward a bit more and would line up with the 1628 BC um, tree ring event. I'm not going to talk about this particular event before again, but um, previously it had been suggested that this was uh, reflecting the eruption of Santorini or Thera in the Mediterranean. We have now demonstrated by identifying the tephra in the ice cores that this was an eruption of Aniak Chak in, in Alaska. And the exact date of the Thera eruption um, has yet to be demonstrated. Anyhow, Mike tried to convince the ice core workers that they needed to revise their, their chronologies, but the ice core workers were having none of it. They argued that they had fixed points in their chronology and they were absolutely certain that the chronology had um, very little error at these points. These included 1362, when, when Arifiokal in Iceland erupted, and effectively, we had identified the 1362, the ash from Raphael Oakle 1362 in the ice cores. So at that point in the ice cores, we knew there was zero error. Um, the next event was Hecla 1104, 
Unfortunately, HECLA 1104-TEFRA hasn't been identified in the ICE scores, so we can't say that there is zero error at this point because we haven't proven that the, the layer they think was produced by HECLA in 1104 actually came from that eruption and not another eruption. Elga, um, another Icelandic eruption, they have dated to 933 here based on an, an assumed date for the eruption based on a variety of different documentary records. In fact, there is no historical date for the Elga Tefra. We just know it, it erupted round about this time, but the precise date um, was open to question. Uh, then the next event, 529, isn't precisely dated because it, its source is not known. Um, and then we have Vesuvius, the famous 79 AD Vesuvius Tefra, which they thought they could see very clearly in all the ice cores. Um, and one um, uh, tephra chronologist in Italy had thought he had identified the tephra in the grape ice core. Um, the, the evidence that was put forward was a little bit on the flimsy side, um, and we were not completely convinced by this. Uh, the Danes, on the other hand, were utterly convinced, the Danish ice core workers, to the point that when they cored the Neem ice core, um, and they identified a, a, a cloudy air as they pulled the, uh, the, the ice up out of the, the ice core. Um, they were able to say, oh, look, there's the Vesuvius layer. So they're absolutely convinced that they had Vesuvius. And on that basis, they said, we know our counting is good back at 79 AD, so we're not going to move the, the dates um, of the, the 530s to uh, volcanic events. Um, and it almost seemed to come to an impasse um, until Michael Siegel started working with Joe McConnell and looking at some of the ice core records in great detail. And one of the things that they applied, but first of all, they went and counted the ice cores independently, looked at the ice cores, and they also tried to obtain independent evidence for the dating of the, the younger part of the core. So one of the ways they could do this was to look for the radioisotope uh, beryllium beryllium 10. So you're probably all familiar with radiocarbon, uh, which is a radioisotope that's formed in the high atmosphere. Uh, beryllium 10 is formed in the same way by the same processes. So when you've got increases or decreases in radiocarbon, you get beryllium 10 behaving in a similar kind of way. Um, and we know from the tree ring records that there were certain periods when, uh, I can't remember if it's more, radiocarbon was being produced or less radiocarbon, it goes counter to the way it gets recorded. Um, but the solar proton events or cosmic events can create a uh, greater production of the radioisotopes. The trees will record this when they get radiocarbon dated, we'll see these peaks in radiocarbon and the beryllium 10 gets precipitated out into the ice cores and it too can be detected. So we knew, we knew from the tree rings of two radiocarbon spikes at 775 and 993. Um, and when Michael Siegel and his team looked for the beryllium, they found the beryllium spikes. And once they had those spikes, they knew the historical date from the tree rings, essentially, they were able to attach those dates firmly to the ice cores. And what those dates proved was that the ice core chronology, the, the, the existing ice core chronology was too old. So the 933 Elgia event gets moved to 939, which also ties in with historical records. It could have been either of the dates. Um, and the 536, uh, the 536 event, 533 event that Larson had identified gets pulled up to 540, and the 529 BC AD event gets pulled up to 536. So everything is shunted forward by seven years. Um, on top of that, so we had a look at the, the so-called Vesuvius layer in the Neem ice core. Uh, Michael Siegel had sampled some of this and sent it to us for analysis. And we checked to see if there was any tephra. So uh, Barbente had identified what he thought was uh, Vesuvius tephra associated with this acid layer. We identified tephra, not tiny little bits of tephra that Carlo Brabante had reported, but really decent shards of glass. And we were able to analyze these and find out uh, where they, well, 
find out where they were not coming from, I should say, uh, because where they were not coming from was Vesuvius. So we can look at the chemistry, we can compare it to Vesuvius glass. So the, the little squares represent points analysis um, from the Vesuvius tephra, um, and the red dots represent the neem tephra that we were identifying. So clearly different on all the elements, they were clearly different. Um, but our glass most closely matches Aniakchak in Alaska. It's probably not Aniakchak, it's, it, there are slight differences, but I suspect it is um, of an Alaskan source. So Michael Siegel had redated the ice cores and said AD 79 is not AD 79, and we'd identified the tephra and proved that it wasn't from Vesuvius. Um, Furthermore, the redating shows that the 536 and the 540 events are volcanic, so we don't have to invoke um, uh, impact events. Um, and the 43 BC event is also volcanic. So the, everything starts to line up and point towards volcanoes as the, the cause of the environmental downturns. And hence, Mike was right in the first place. They were volcanic events and the trees were responding to volcanic impacts. So that's kind of Mike's part of the story. Um, where do I come in? Well, we had a look at some of these events and uh, I'm going to tell you what we found about, uh, found out about the 536 and 43 BC events. Um, the 536 one, as I said, had moved, the, the Larson's two events had moved forward in time. And what Michael Siegel identified by comparing the the acid signals in Greenland with the acid signals in Antarctica was that the 536 event was only seen in the northern hemisphere in, the, in Greenland, suggesting that the source was in the northern hemisphere. But the 540 event was represented by acid layers both in Antarctica and in Greenland, suggesting that the volcano that caused it was more likely in the tropical region because the, the, the aerosols can disperse to the poles if it's in the tropics. But it's unlikely if it was if the eruption was in the Northern Hemisphere, that it would make it all the way to, to Antarctica or vice versa. Um, as well as that, we have two records uh, that enable us to reconstruct what temperatures were like. So when we get trees that are growing in temperature sensitive areas, we can reconstruct temperature curves through time. Um, and the tree ring reconstructions, temperature reconstructions, were suggesting that these events were associated with a temperature dip of two to three degrees, uh, which is a significant decline in temperatures lasting for um, a protracted period of time. So we're looking at an impact that lasted a couple of, of decades. From a societal perspective, that's a long time to have a, a climate downturn. <clears throat> Um, we looked at the ice. We were able to get ice for 536, but unfortunately the core was broken, so we didn't get ice at 540. So we haven't looked at the 540 event. Um, although uh, Joe McConnell's data from the ice cores suggests that there probably isn't effort. He can, he can measure particles as he's analysing the ice in his lab, and there, don't, there didn't seem to be a lot of particles present at this time. So that would fit with the 540 event being much further away from Greenland, uh, that the ash wouldn't actually reach the, the poles. But the 536 layer had tephra and it had beautiful tephra, really large shards, uh, very different types of shards. Um, as you can see here, little minerals in the glass make the analysis a little bit difficult, but we were able to get a good set of analyses. And what we found was that we didn't have a single tephra, but we had several populations of tephra. By populations, I'm referring to where the points group in, um, and separate out and are clearly different, di differentiated from each other. So we're not absolutely sure where any of these are coming from. Um, on the one hand, it would seem that uh, we have some matching a volcano in um, Alaska. Again, it's similar to Aniakchak, but it's not quite Aniakchak. But whatever it is, it's the same as the one that was erupting in not 79 AD. Um, we have another that's similar to a Californian uh, volcano, not a large eruption, in fact, quite an insignificant eruption, um, but maybe less insignificant than we realised. And another one, not entirely sure where, where they're coming from. I suspect they're all North American. Perhaps one could be tropical, could be from 
Mexico, but we're not absolutely certain. Um, but but I think it's it's possibly significant that we can't link any of these to a, a, a known eruption because all the big eruptions have really been studied. So if, they ha if any of them had been a big eruption, we probably would have been able to find a correlation. Uh, so I have suggested that maybe we're looking at three relatively insignificant eruptions. Any one of them on their own wouldn't have had an impact, but the fact that we have three eruptions or maybe even more going off at the same time is the equivalent of uh, a single large eruption. So all, I, I strongly suspect one of them is uh, from Alaska. The other two, I'm not absolutely sure about yet. Did the eruption have a societal impact? Well, in Mike's records, the, the, this is one of the events that seems to line up with records, uh, early historical records, documentary records for um, atmospheric events, for famines, um, for issues generally. Um, there are things like plagues happening in various different places, and this precedes the, the spread of Justinian plague across Europe. Um, so it's possible that these events are due to the, the impact of a climatic downturn following the series of volcanic eruptions at 536 and then again at 540. Um, from an Irish perspective, so all very well and good what's going on in China, Egypt and the Mediterranean, but the real question is what's going on in Ireland? Um, Mike had been, as well as looking at climate anomalies, um, keeping an eye on what was coming out of the dates when they were dating archaeological sites. So I should also credit Dave Brown um, for his work in um, analysing tree rings as they came into Belfast for dating. Um, and they had noticed a gap in the, the production of archaeological sites. So there have been lots of building in the Iron Age um, and then there was lots of building again in the early medieval period. And in between, there was a long period of not much happening. Uh, that happens to coincide with the um, woodland regeneration evident in the pollen records. So um, Mike had suggested that maybe an environmental event had, had acted as a kind of stimulus for building in Ireland at this time. It's plausible to an extent, but from my perspective, coincidence does not prove causation. Just because they happen close in time doesn't mean that the, the, the events or the, the, the constructions were the res result of a climate uh, downturn or perturbation. But that brings us on to looking at the, the earlier event, the AD, the, the should be 44 BC event, um, and whether a volcanic event was responsible for the collapse of the, the Iron Age, because what happens in the early centuries AD um, remain a, a bit uncertain. We're getting more information about it now, but for a long period of time, we really did not know what was happening. I can't believe I put AD 44, and I, I had, had, had e, BC, and I'd gone changing BCE to BC. Anyhow, what do we know about the 44 BC event? Um, well, we know that there were a series of events um, in Europe round about this time. Southers and Rampino had gone through a lot of historical records and collected information about various different phenomena happening, uh, atmospheric phenomena, as, as well as societal responses, um, potentially linked to volcanic eruptions. Um, and they reported evidence for protected eclipses after the murder of Caesar. Um, after Caesar's death, the sun didn't seem to be shining so brightly. Um, and then there were crop failures. And we know that around about this time, there was the, the eruption of Mount Etna in Italy. So this seemed to be a possibility. Etna erupts and was close to where the Romans were recording these events, so potentially that was the source of the, the, the issues that they were seeing. So um, Rampino and Studders decide that in the ice cores, there is an acid signal around about 50 BC. So Mike has talked about this. Um, and they recognize that this is one of the largest volcanic eruptions in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, based on, on information put out by Hammer et al., the ice core, the Danish ice core workers. Um, 
Furthermore, they went on to say that they believed that the evidence that they had assembled, the various different documentary reports, um, suggested that the eruption um, in question was Etna in 44 BC. Um, so what we, we do know is that there were certain types of atmospheric um, it phenomena recorded sometime after Caesar's death. We know that there was an eruption of Etna after Caesar's death. The records don't say exactly how long after Caesar's death, whether it was very soon after, several years after. Um, we know that from the ice cores that there was obviously a very large volcanic eruption around this time. And we know that the tree rings record uh, a period of stress. Now, should the Irish tree rings don't, at the time we didn't have any Irish tree rings covering this period, but North American trees were showing evidence for stress in 43 BC. Um, the Roman, the, the reports for what was happening in Rome included um, evidence for, for crop failures that um, beleaguered, the, beleaguered the Republic at the time when it was suffering from uh, political turmoil. So Joe was interested in this event and he has studied it at high resolution. He's gone in and he's looked at it very closely and he identifies that there aren't, there isn't just one sulfur peak reflecting a volcanic eruption, but rather there's two. There's a smaller one and then a larger one. And he subsampled this in very fine detail and sent me a sample and I identified tephra that corresponds to the beginning of the larger sulfur peak. Um, and this is, what, this is what the ice core samples look like. It's water, the ice melts um, in a bottle. It's shipped to me. I put it into a tube, centrifuge it and concentrate the particles and let them on the slide and analyze them. And we found tephra, nice tephra. As you see here, a brown tephra. And we were able to analyze them and get some results. Um, and we could show our points are the the red, the red points represent the ice core tephra. Um, they're clearly not Etna, and they're not any of the other eruptions that we know erupted around about this time um, in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, but what they do correspond to is Okmok, which is in Alaska. So it's on the, in the Aleutian Islands, um, a large volcanic eruption, which we knew had erupted round about um, Around about this time, I can't remember what date it was, but it, the, the, the dates for the eruption were pretty close. Um, and the tephra, the tephra chemistry matches it perfectly. So we can be absolutely certain that the eruption of Okmok produced this tephra that ended up um, in the ice cores. So we know it was a large eruption. We could tell from the volcano itself that it was a large eruption, the, the, the remnants of what was left. Um, but it's in the high latitude and common thinking would be that if you've got a large eruption in a high latitude, it's not going to have a big impact on climate because it's so far north, um, it's not having such an impact on solar radiation affecting other parts of the, the, the hemisphere. But we investigated this. Um, so we looked at the, uh, the temperature anomalies reconstructed from tree rings. We looked at the uh, variety of different historical records to identify what was happening around about this time. Um, and historical records indicate that there was something happening around about 44 BC, but these tended to be in the area around Italy and something happening at 43 to 42 BC. And the dendro uh, climate reconstructions, the temperature reconstructions were suggesting that in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, there was a cooling happening at 43 and 42 BC. So associated with the larger of the two volcanic signals. Again, we're left, so we have good evidence from the tree rings supported by the documentary events, that the documentary evidence that there was a cooling um, following the volcanic eruption of Okmok around about 40, uh, 40, 43 BC. But did Okmok cause those? This is the really difficult question to answer. Well, there are two, two ways to look at this. So for a volcanic eruption to have an impact on climate, the material has to go high up into the atmosphere. It has, has to reach the stratosphere. If it's below the stratosphere, the, volcanic, the, the aerosols will be washed out um, pretty quickly and won't have the same impact on the climate. So one way to investigate this is to look at the sulfur isotopes, so the sulfates that are produced um, 
as a result of the eruption, we can look at the sulfur isotopes contained within them and the sulfur isotopes will tell us if it reached the stratosphere or not. So Andrea Burke in St Andrews looked at the, the sulfates and demonstrated that yes, they had reached the stratosphere, which meant that the volcano at least had the potential to impact on climate. The next thing we did was run some climate models. So knowing from the amount of sulfur that was deposited in Greenland, knowing where the volcano was, we could model how much sulfur must have been produced in order for that much sulfur to land on Greenland. And then we could put that into a climate model to be able to extrapolate what kind of impact would this much sulfur in the atmosphere have on the climate? And what would that look like um, over the region of Europe, North Africa? And the climate models demonstrate that there would have been a cooling in Europe, um, lasting maybe two years. So this is the reconstruction of the temperatures um, and also um, higher levels of rainfall. So the precipitation was much higher. And the model is effectively very consistent with the tree ring reconstructions for what was happening, as well as the historical data um, for what was being observed on the continent. So, so, so potentially the volcano had an impact on climate. They seem to, to match up very well. But of course, what about in Ireland? What happened in Ireland? Again, if we just look at the climate model, we can see that Ireland has a very small uh, climate temperature. So it, 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 it cools a little bit. More significantly, it seems to get drier. Um, so potentially the drought could have impacted pasture, but the pollen evidence suggests that the landscape in Ireland at this time was quite well forested. So it's unlikely that, that, that cattle, for example, would have had uh, a shortage of food to eat um, at this time. So did Okmok trigger uh, climate change over Europe? Very likely. Did it have an impact in Ireland? I would say relatively limited evidence that it had. But ultimately, I thought this was the perfect study. On the one hand, we identified the culprit. We identified the mechanism. Uh, we were to say how much sulfur it produced that it got up into the atmosphere and predict what kind of impact that sulfur um, uh, injection into the atmosphere would have on the climate. And then we were able to corroborate that uh, by reference to the historical events. So that was the Okmok story. To conclude, um, well, Mike was right. The ice core dates were wrong. Mike was right. The, the tree ring records were telling us about volcanic eruptions. Um, and we have good evidence that those volcanic eruptions um, had an impact on, not only on tree rings, but also on the wider environment. Um, we have now got a good set of evidence for volcanic events and their effects on tree rings. Uh, generally speaking, the volcanic impacts trigger relatively short-lived environmental changes. So we're talking about often just a couple of years, but potentially over longer time periods, particularly if you get multiple eruptions happening in close succession. Um, we now know that 536, 540 um, can be attributed to volcanic eruptions rather than to um, impacts. Um, and Ulf Buntgen has ar argued that these are just the beginning of a series of other volcanic eruptions that had a much longer um, impact on, on climate and also on society. Oh, AD 44. 44 BC event was the result of Okmok. Uh, the, the climate modeling corroborates the historical events. So previous cynics had, had suggested that the historical events might have been exaggerated, they mightn't have been accurate. Effect, well, it, it might seem like a, a circular argument. The climate records corroborate, the, the climate modeling corroborates what, what's observed in the historical events, suggesting that the, what the Romans were saying was happening was probably happening. Um, did the climate anomaly affect the Roman Republic? Did it cause the collapse of the Roman Republic? Well, I think that would be a big stretch. We know that the Roman Republic was already um, struggling at this time, but it is possible, I think, to say that the, the weather anomalies won't have helped their situation 
Um, overall, I would conclude that direct societal impacts are not easily demonstrated, that there are often a whole set of, of conditions that you have to consider before deciding whether a society was vulnerable to, to climate events or whether there were other factors at play. But I think it's safe to say that the tree rings don't lie. They just sometimes mumble and we're not quite sure what they're telling us. So thank you very much. I'll finish there. I should identify the chat. That so, was brilliant. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you um, no, let's see. They're not all on muting yet. No. Yeah, I was looking at the chat. I don't see my don't see any um are there any questions? No, uh, it's just mind blowing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that was a lovely and, and, and really exciting um, um, uh, uh, lecture to start the year. It's fantastic mm -hmm. overview of a story that's ongoing and it's massive importance, not only for Ireland, but for, for throughout the world. So thank you for um, summarising it so con uh, uh, concisely. Yes. yes. Thanks, Rory. Okay. <coughs> I'd just like to second that, by the way. I thought that was an excellent presentation, Jill. <laughs> Well done. Even if I put in AD 44 instead of 44 BC, <laughs> that's what happens when I'm trying to do lectures and presentations at the same time. I don't envy you. <laughs> <laughs> I did enjoy it very much. I've yeah, a... I did too, Joel. Thanks very much. <sighs> I had a question. Somebody's asked about the Justinian plague and what was the significance of it. Okay, I'm going to pass it on to Mike, if I may. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, anyone who wants to find out about it should listen to Melvin Bragg's program last Thursday yeah. morning on, because uh, they had a whole 45 minute discussion on it. Um, basically, it was a major plague um, and seems to have run across Europe uh, in, in waves over a period of uh, many decades. Um, as a catastrophist, I would have said to us, it came and wiped out a third of the population. But if you listen to the experts, um, should I say historians, uh, they take a much more muted view. Uh, I, I tend to over, overstate things, yeah. More or less to stimulate people to prove me wrong, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's true, is it not, Mike, that the Justinian plague and the Black Death had massive um, mortality rates um, that dwarf what we're seeing at the moment with COVID. Yeah, I mean, basically, basically these are the first two great pandemics. Um, and it, the round figures are about a third, up to sometimes a half of the population dying. Um, you see, one of, the, one of the tensions you have is that some historians will state that quite clearly. Um, and then there are other historians who are nervous about um, invoking the effects of, of um, non-human agents. So they try to play things down. So it's an ongoing discussion. There's, there's uh, a lot of information out there. I, I think you can take it that things were pretty bad. And that's well reflected in the sixth century because there's so little documentation from the period from 540 to 600. Um, and a lot, a lot of the information we do have is quasi-mythical rather than actual historical documentation. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. I, I could just point out, Mike, and, and you know it as well, that there is there is a, a dendrochronological blip um, starting basically after 540. So the, there are a lot of sites being built between you know, 550 and, and early 600s AD. Is that correct? Oh, yes, yes, yes. We, after, after the Iron Age lull, when we see mm. very few sites being built, we suddenly see, I don't know what, um, I don't have the figures to hand, but more or less a continuous stream. Yep. Every few years, we've got another site date uh, running right through for centuries. So mm. it's... Um, it's quite clear something changed dramatically in, in Ireland uh, at and around the 540s. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, yeah, the, the events that, that, that 
led to the five to the construction in the five forties could have been in place century potentially centuries. There could be emerging um, changes happening in, in advance of that. So that's where I would say just because we see the buildings happening following the event doesn't mean the event caused the buildings. That it's part of a continuum, <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> Are, are we on live television or is this just a muted UAS thing? Yeah. Because if it was just a muted small number of people, I could say, well, that's the bee you have in your bonnet, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're live, Mike. It does no. say live oh, on YouTube, bonnet. Mike, I would like to point out. <laughs> <laughs> well, Personal take your amusement where you can. Has anyone but, else? I was, just going, I was just going to say that that societies. Run, so I think one of the, one of my my view is that um, we make ourselves vulnerable to certain to, to certain things. So plagues will have a bigger impact, um, or pandemics or contagious diseases will have a bigger impact if you've got a built up population. If you have a rural population and people are spread out, so says I from the comfort of a rural location, um, then you're less likely to catch things um, and the population is less likely to be affected by them. So in Ireland, we don't have evidence that people were living on top of each other in the, the early 500s. So why would, a, why would a contagious disease be able to spread and decimate the population? So, so that's why I don't, I, don't, I don't think Justinian plague will have had as great an impact in a place like Ireland. Um, religion, religion, you know, there were all sorts of other things happening at this time, so it's difficult. It, it, but I would say it's, it's never a straightforward case when it comes to humans. We, we always have to look at the many other factors that are um, at play. And humans are complex individuals who make things more complex for themselves than they have to. Uh, let's see. I see there was a question popped up there. How common is it that several volcanoes erupt about the same time? And is there, any, is there any special significance to be attached to that? I would say that there are, well, there are always volcanoes erupting. There are always volcanoes erupting. Um, and sometimes there are lots of large volcano, large-ish volcanoes erupting around about the same time. Um, we did wonder about the... 536 one that you know particularly if the potential sources were sitting around the pacific rim um we'll put that one on hold for the moment uh, but but it, but we have other occasions where we've got multiple eruptions going off at the same time and we see that in the TEFA record as well okay. anybody else with any questions anyone um, I think Jill said you said that you were going to be uh, you were going to allow us to put this up on the UAS Facebook site in a couple of days' time. Is that right? So for for those of us who aren't of the scientific side of archaeology, it'd be nice to have a chance to rewatch and kind of take in some more of the, the technical detail. Um, so you you will be happy or, uh, if we put it up. Yeah, no problem. That's brilliant. Um, any other questions? No, no. Okay. Well, um, I suppose I should bring the evening uh, uh, to an end and just to thank Dr. Jill Plunkett again for a fascinating and, and uh, um, uh, very detailed uh, um, talk and say great start 2021 um, with a, a lecture of this calibre. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Roy. Well done. So with that in mind, I'll probably ask uh, Duncan if he's still there, maybe to uh, bring the evening to a close and we'll see some of you at the AG 